Lecture number five, Rebirth and Common. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. The question of human destiny after death is probably one of the most crucial questions we can raise. Nowadays, it's become fashionable to discuss, to dismiss the question as unimportant. People think that instead of wasting our time over this question, we should turn our attention to the things that are really important in the present life. That we should either try to grasp as much pleasure and enjoyment while we can, or else we should work on improvements in government and society and the economic order and so on. But if we reflect on the extent to which our views influence our actions, we'll see that it's really quite essential to gain some understanding of the complete context in which our lives unfold and not remain content just to live in ignorance. Also, how we view the afterlife will help determine what we regard as important to do now in this present life. If we dismiss the idea of a future life as imaginary, then it will make sense to devote ourselves completely to worldly concerns. On the other hand, if we accept the idea of some life after death, then that will influence our path of conduct, the path that we follow in this life. It will give meaning to the values of renunciation, contemplation, and spiritual exertion. It seems that there are three possible positions that can be taken on human destiny after death. One position, the outlook of materialism, simply denies that there is an afterlife. It holds that the human being, the person, consists essentially of matter, configurations of molecules, cells, and so on. And it says that the mind is just a byproduct of matter. So after death, with the breakup of the physical body, all consciousness comes to an end. The life process is completely extinguished and nothing remains but the dead matter of the body. A second alternative is that held in the Western theistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in their orthodox forms. This position is the belief in an eternal afterlife. According to these religions, we live a single life on earth, and then after death we go on to live eternally in some state of existence, determined by our present beliefs and conduct, either in an everlasting heavenly world or else in an eternal hell. Then there is a third view, the view which prevails in the religions of the East, Hinduism and Buddhism. This is the idea of rebirth. According to this view, this present life is only a single link in a chain of lives that goes back into the past and forward into the future. This chain of lives, of rebirth, is called samsara. The word samsara means literally continuing, wandering on. And it signifies the cycle of birth, growth, aging, and death, repeating itself over and over. Now, both Hinduism and Buddhism share the concept of rebirth, but the Buddhist conception differs somewhat from the Hindu doctrine. The doctrine of rebirth, as understood in Hinduism, involves a permanent soul, a conscious entity, which transmigrates from one body to another. The soul inhabits a given body, then when life is extinguished in that body, the soul casts that body off and goes on to take on another body. The famous Hindu classic, the Bhagavad Gita, compares this to a man, a man who might take off one suit of clothing, then after taking that off, he puts on another suit of clothing. Then after wearing that for some time, he throws that off and puts on still another coat. The man remains the same, but the suits of clothing are different. In the same way, the soul remains the same from life to life, but the psychophysical organism it takes on differs from life to life. Now, the Buddhist doctrine of rebirth is somewhat different from this. 
First of all, the Buddhist term for the rebirth process is in Pali, punabhava, a word which means again existence. And Buddhism sees rebirth not as the transmigration of a self-identical soul, a conscious entity, but rather as the repeated occurrence of the process of existence. The word punabhava can be rendered perhaps as repeated becoming, renewed becoming. And there is a continuity, a transmission of influence, a causal link-up between one life and, uh, and another. But there is no soul, no permanent entity which transmigrates from one life to the next. The concept of rebirth without a transmigrating soul commonly raises a certain question. This is the question, how can rebirth occur without a soul or self to undergo the process of being reborn? How can we speak of ourselves as having lived past lives there is no soul, no single self going through these many lives. To understand how this is possible, we first have to understand the nature of individual identity in a single lifetime, how individual identity is possible in one lifetime without a self or a soul. We can approach this by reviewing the Buddhist analysis of what we are, what our individuality consists in. The Buddha explains that what we really are is a functionally unified combination of the five aggregates. The five aggregates fall into two basic types of processes. First, there's the material process which is a current of material energy. Then there's the mental process, a current of mental happening, mind and the mental factors. Now, both these currents consist of elements that are subject to momentary arising and passing away. What we call the body, the physical body, is not a single substantial entity but a combination of many elements, pulsations of matter connected together in lines of transmission, becoming manifest at the material level. The mind also is not a single persisting ego entity enduring through time. The mind is a series, a connected series of mental acts made up of the four aggregates, the four mental aggregates, feelings, perceptions, the mental formations, and consciousness. These mental acts or thought moments are called in Pali chittas. Each chitta is an individual act of mind, an act of consciousness, involving the factors of feeling, perception, the mental formations, and consciousness. Each chitta arises, persists for a very brief moment performing its function, experiencing the object. Then immediately after that, it breaks up and passes away. When it breaks up and passes away, it doesn't leave any trace of itself behind. It doesn't have any core or any inner essence that remains. But as soon as the chitta breaks up and disintegrates, Immediately, right afterwards, there arises another chitta, another act of mind, which again flashes into existence, experiences its object with awareness, and then passes away. And so it goes on, chitta after chitta after chitta. And thus we find the mind is a succession of chittas, of mental acts, of these momentary acts of consciousness. Now, when each chitta falls away, it transmits to its successor whatever impressions have been recorded upon itself, whatever experiences it has undergone, its perception, its emotions, its volitional force, 
all of these get passed on to the next chitta. And thus all the experiences we undergo, every fleeting thought, sensation, decision, and so on, leaves its imprint on the onward flow of consciousness, on the chitta santana, the continuum of mind. And this transmission of influence, this causal continuity, this gives us our continued identity. We remain the same person or being through the whole lifetime because of this continuity, even though there is no ego entity, no self standing underneath the process. Now, the physical organism, the body, and the mental continuum, the stream of chitas, occur in close interconnection. The body provides the physical basis for the succession of chitas, the flow of the mental process. And the mental process rests upon the body as its instrument and basis. But when death comes, the physical body can no longer function as the physical support for consciousness. It can no longer support the chitas, the process of mind. So when the body breaks up at death, the succession of chitas doesn't draw to an end. In the mind of the dying person, there takes place one final thought moment called the death consciousness. This last chitta, this last thought moment, signals the complete end of the life. Then following the death consciousness, there occurs another chitta, another active mind, the first chitta of the new life. And this chitta springs up with a new physical organism as its basis, a newly fertilized ovum. This first chitta of the new life continues the stream of consciousness which is just passed out of the old, deceased body. The stream of consciousness is not a single entity but a process. And the process continues. The death consciousness in the series is followed by a new moment of consciousness which arises with a new physical organism as its basis. This first act of consciousness is called the patisandhi chitta. We mentioned this last time. The relinking consciousness. And it's called the relinking consciousness because it links together the two separate life terms. It belongs to the same continuum. The relinking consciousness inherits all the impressions of past experience undergone in that current of consciousness in the previous life and also in the many lives before that. In this way, all the impressions recorded and stored up in the mental continuum in that individual stream of experience all of these now get transmitted to the first chitta of the new life. This first chitta, when it passes away, passes the storage of experience on to the second moment, along with its own addition. The second passes it on to the third, the third to the fourth, and so on from thought moment to thought moment, chitta to chitta, all the ways from birth to death. Then, when that life comes to an end, again the stream of cheetahs will pass on to the next life. And when it passes on, it carries the storage of impressions along with it. And so the entire process will be repeated once more. We can give an illustration how this preservation of identity can take place without any self-identical entity. Suppose we have a candle burning, say, at 8 o'clock. If we come back in an hour at 9 o'clock, we see that the candle is still burning, and we can say that it's still the same candle. And this statement is completely valid from the standpoint of conventional linguistic usage. But if we examine this matter close up, we'll see that at every moment the candle is burning up different particles of wax. Every moment it's burning a different section of the wick, 
Every moment it's consuming different molecules of air, of oxygen. And thus the wax, the wick, and the oxygen being burned are always different from moment to moment. And yet, because the moments of flame link together in a continuum, one moment of flame giving rise to the next, we can still say it's the same flame. But actually, the flame is different from moment to moment because its base, its wick, its fuel, the particles of oxygen, these are all different from moment to moment. And the flame itself is an entirely dependent phenomenon. It's conditioned by the wax, wick, and air. And apart from them, it's really nothing. It's just a derivative of these three placed at a certain temperature. Okay, now we go on to the next step. Suppose the flame reaches the bottom of the candle. We then take a new candle. We put its wick to the flame and catch the flame from the old candle onto the new one. Then the flame on the old candle goes out. So the flame has now been transmitted to the new candle. Is it the same flame or a different flame? From one angle, we can say that it's the same flame. The reason? Because it follows in continuity. It belongs to the same series. But now the flame is burning with a new physical basis, with a new candle as its support. It's burning up new particles of air, new pieces of wax, a new section of wick, we can say it's the same flame as the flame on the old candle because it caught fire from that flame and it continues the succession. But there is no absolute identity of one flame with the other because there is no condition contributing to that flame that's absolutely identical with the previous condition. It can't be called, be called a different flame to call it a different flame would do violence to conventional usage. Conventionally, we say it's the same flame, and yet there is no absolute or ultimate identity because the whole flame is just a process of combustion which goes on differently from moment to moment. Now we can apply the simile to the case of rebirth. The body of the candle is like the physical body of the person. The wick might be compared to the sense faculties that function as the support for the process of consciousness. The particles of oxygen, these are like the sense objects, and the flame, that is like consciousness. Consciousness always arises with the physical body as its support. It always arises through a particular sense faculty, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind. It always has an object, sight, sound, smell, and so forth. The body, the sense faculty, and the object are always changing. And therefore, consciousness with the mental factors are always changing. But because each act of mind, each thought moment, follows in sequence from its predecessors and gives rise to the next, and because the content of the mind, the set of impressions, tendencies, dispositions, and so on, because these are passed on from one moment to another, we speak about the body-mind compound as being the same person at different times. We say it's the same man, the same woman, and so on. Now, when the body loses its vitality, when death takes place, that is like the first candle coming to an end. The transmission of the flame to the next candle, that is like the passing of the current of consciousness, the mental continuum, on to the next life. Then, when the mental continuum takes up the new body, that is like the flame of the old candle passing on to the new candle. And just as there is the causal transmission of the flame from one candle to the other, so in the same way there is a passing on of mind, of the mental process, 
from one physical body to the next. The Buddha teaches that in order for conception to take place, the presence of this stream of mind, this mental process, is absolutely necessary. Without the mind or mind continuum, there can be no rebirth. The Buddha says that there are three necessary concept conditions for conception to take place. First of all, there has to be the union of father and mother, the father to, prov to provide the sperm, the mother to provide the egg. The second condition is that it must be the mother's proper season. If the mother isn't fertile, conception won't take place. But then the Buddha says there is a third condition. This he calls the Gandhava. The Gandhava is the stream of consciousness of the deceased person, the flow of mind that's ready, prepared to take rebirth. And the Buddha says that even though the father and mother have intercourse, and even though it's the mother's fertile season, if the Gandhava, the appropriate stream of mind, is not present, then conception will not take place. But when all the three conditions are met, when the Gandhava is present, then conception can take place. The egg will be fertilized, it will form a primary cell, and the new life process will begin. Now another question comes up. That is, is there any causal structure behind this process of rebirth? Does it just go on automatically and inevitably? Or is there some set of causes underlying it that sustain it and keep it rolling? The Buddha teaches that there is a distinct set of causes underlying the rebirth process that the rebirth process has a causal structure. This structure is set out in the teaching of dependent arising, the Ticca Samuppada, which we explained in the last talk. But now we will take up this doctrine again and explain it in specific connection with the working of the rebirth process. First of all, in this life, there is present in us the most basic root of all becoming. That is ignorance, abhijja. And because of our ignorance, we perceive things in a distorted way through the perversion. Things appear to us to be permanent, pleasurable, attractive, and to stand in some relation to our self, to be a self or the belongings of a self. Because of these distortions, there arises in us craving. Craving for sense pleasures, craving for existence, for sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, and ideas. Basically, craving hangs on to pleasant feelings. The Buddha says, Vedana Pachaya Tanha, that feeling is the condition for craving. Craving is aroused in our mind by the experience of pleasant feeling, and then we long for the continuation of our pleasant experiences and for their repetition in the future. To obtain pleasant feeling, we require agreeable objects, agreeable sight, sound, smell, taste, tangibles, and ideas. In order to obtain the pleasure these objects can give, we have to make contact with those objects. That is, we need pasta, contact. And to contact the objects, we need sense organs, sense faculties, that are able to receive the sense impressions that can function as the instruments of experience. We need, in other words, the six sense faculties, the salayatana. To see forms, we need the eyes. To hear sounds, we need the ears. To 
smell odors, we need the nose and so on. To experience touches, we need the body. To experience ideas, we need the brain nervous system. Now, in order for these six sense faculties to exist, the entire psychophysical organism is required. That is nama rupa, the mind-body complex. The sense faculties do not operate in disembodied space, but as parts of a total organism. Thus, on account of craving, the mind holds on to this presently existing organism, this nama rupa, as long as it lives. Why? So it can have the six sense faculties to contact agreeable objects through the senses in order that it can enjoy the pleasurable feelings that arise from sense contact. As long as life lasts, we continue to hold on to the same psychophysical organism. Now, when death comes, this body ceases to provide a suitable basis for obtaining pleasure through the senses. Because the sense faculties are dependent upon the rest of the body, when life in the body comes to an end, the senses become defunct. They can no longer serve as the media between the mind and the world. But on account of craving, the mind still wants a world. It wants to experience a world of sight, smells, and so on. And to do so, it needs a physical body. This body can no longer do, can no longer support the mind. But if craving still remains, if there is still the drive for pleasure, for more experience, for continued existence, for sight, sound, smells, taste, touches, and ideas, what can be done? The mind process lets go of this body. Then, through the craving for existence, the mind process grasps hold of a new body. Thus, craving causes the stream of mind to spring up again, grasping on to a fertilized egg, lodging itself in that fertilized egg, bringing the whole storage of accumulated impressions over with it into the new psychophysical organism. And thus we see a new being has been conceived. For this reason, the Buddha calls craving the seamstress, Sibini. Just as a seamstress sews together different pieces of cloth, so craving sews together one life to another. It ties together the succession of life. Thus, samsara, the wandering on in the cycle of existence, is maintained by craving. As long as craving remains, the process goes on. Death is no barrier to the continuation of the process, to the renewal of experience through the six sense faculties. Craving is so powerful that it's able to bridge the gap created by death and to rebuild the whole house of sentient existence again and again, over and over. Now we come to the next question. We see that there's a tremendous variety among the living beings existing in the world. The beings we can see, people and animals, of many different sorts. So we can ask, what is it that causes us to take rebirth in a particular form? Does it all happen through coincidence, through accident, through chance, without any reason? Or is there some principle behind it? What is it that determines the form of rebirth we take? The answer to this question the Buddha gives in the word, Pali word, kama, in Sanskrit, karma. Kama is the factor which determines the specific form our rebirth takes which determines what kind of a person we are at the outset of our life. And it's karma, again, that determines 
a good number of the experiences that we undergo in the course of our life. The word comma means literally action, deed, or doing. But in Buddhism, it means specifically volitional action. The reason, because volition is the chief factor in all action. In a sutta, the Buddha says, Chetanaham bhikave kamang vidami. Monks, it is volition that I call kama. And the reason? Because having willed, one then acts through body, speech, or mind. What really lies behind all action, the essence of all action, is volition, the power of the will. And it is this volition expressing itself as action through body, speech, or mind that the Buddha calls karma. And this means that unintentional action is not karma. If we accidentally step on some ants while walking down the street, that is not the karma of taking life because there's no intention, no volition of taking life. If we speak some statement believing it to be true and it turns out to be false, we're not to blame for the karma of lying because we had no intention of deceiving of lying. Karma refers exclusively to action that is backed up by volition and that expresses volition. Now, karma manifests itself in three ways through three channels called the three doors of action. These are body, speech, and mind. When we act physically, the body serves as the instrument for expressing our volition. Thus, the act done with the body is bodily kama, kaya kama. When we speak, expressing our thoughts and intentions verbally, that is verbal kama, which is performed either directly through speech or else indirectly through writing, through hand signs, or other means of communication. Then when we think, plan, desire inwardly, without any outer action, that is mental kama, mano kama. Thus, there are three types of kama named according to their channel of expression, the door or faculty through which the volition becomes manifest. But what lies behind all of these forms of action is really the mind. And the chief mental factor that causes the action is the volition. When one person injures another, the means of action is the body. But what really inflicts the injury is the volition, the factor of mind. When one person helps another, gives another a helping hand, what is doing the action is the body, but what lies behind the action is the mind of helpfulness. So outwardly, so outward actions are the expressions of volition. For this reason, the Buddha singles out volition as the decisive factor in action. And all volitional action is called karma. People sometimes show their misunderstanding of the concept of karma when they think of the things that happen to them as their karma. That is not their karma. That is the effect or the fruit of their karma. If they meet a lot of trouble, they say, oh, this is my karma. But that isn't their karma. Karma is the active force, the present action. Many of the troublesome situations people find themselves in come about because of their past karma, their past actions. And the misery that they now feel over their situation, that is not the result of old karma, though. That is a way of reacting to the present situation. That is a form of action, of present karma. It is a karma rooted in aversion, in ill will, and therefore it's an unwholesome karma which will produce unfavorable effects in the future. 
which will only perpetuate their trouble. Now, the main standpoint from which Buddhism classifies karma is the ethical standpoint, since it's the ethical quality of action that determines the kind of results it will produce. And the Buddha divides karma right down the middle into two general classes. On one side, he puts unwholesome karma, akusala karma. On the other side, he puts wholesome karma, wholesome action, kusala karma. Unwholesome action, unwholesome karma is action which is spiritually harmful and morally blameworthy. Wholesome karma is the opposite, action which is spiritually beneficial and morally praiseworthy. And the Buddha gives two basic criteria for distinguishing unwholesome and wholesome commas. One is the intention behind the action. Action which is intended to bring about harm to oneself, to bring harm to others, or to bring harm to both, that is unwholesome karma. On the other hand, karma which conduces to the good of oneself, to the good of others, and to the good of both, that is wholesome karma. So that's the first criterion. The other criterion the Buddha gives for distinguishing unwholesome and wholesome karma is the roots of action. Now, the Buddha teaches that all karma, all action, arises from certain mental factors called roots. These are the causal factors of action, the source, the motivation of action. All unwholesome actions come from three unwholesome roots. These are greed, aversion, and delusion. Greed is selfish desire aimed at personal gratification, expressed as grasping, craving, and attachment. Aversion is ill will, hatred, resentment, anger a negative evaluation of the object. Then the third unwholesome root is delusion. That is ignorance, mental unclarity, confusion. And any occasion of unwholesome action, the Buddha says, can be traced to one or another of these three roots. On the wholesome side, we also find three roots. These are non-greed, non-aversion, and non-delusion. Non-greed becomes manifest as detachment and generosity. It's the quality of being able to renounce objects of desire or to give away valuable things to others. The second wholesome root is non-aversion. That is expressed positively as goodwill, as friendliness and loving kindness. The third wholesome root, non-delusion, that is really the same as wisdom, understanding, mental clarity. And any action which is rooted in one or another of these three wholesome roots is a wholesome action, a kusala kama. Because of the great importance of the roots, we have to be very careful how we judge actions, our own and others. Often there can be a sharp difference between the outer action and the mental ground from which that action springs. If we look into our own mind to see the roots of the acts that we pride ourselves on, we might be less elated over our good deeds. And so too for the deeds of others, these might call for a more careful evaluation. We might be doing a lot of good work for others outwardly, but the underlying motive behind our good works might be a desire to gain fame and recognition, a form of the unwholesome root greed, craving for name and fame. Somebody else might be sitting quietly, meditating, seemingly aloof, but inwardly he might be developing a mind of great loving kindness and compassion. People might criticize him as for doing nothing, for seeking only his own good. 
but he might be doing more to benefit the world than the active do-gooder who's out there driven by desire for name and fame. Now, there are ten main forms of unwholesome action called the dasa akusala kamapatta, the ten courses of unwholesome action. Three of these are bodily. Taking life, taking what doesn't belong to oneself, and engaging in sexual misconduct, adultery, seduction, and so on. Four of these are verbal, speaking falsehood, speaking slanderous speech or divisive speech, speaking harshly, and then engaging in idle chatter, in gossip. Then the last three unwholesome courses of action are purely mental. It is a mind of covetousness, yearning for the possessions of others very strongly. Then the mind of ill will, actively desiring harm and suffering and destruction to come to others. And the last is holding wrong views, especially fixed wrong views which deny the efficacy of moral action. The opposite of these are the ten courses of wholesome action. That is basically abstaining from these ten courses and performing the opposite virtues. Avoiding taking of life, one dwells with a compassionate mind. Avoiding stealing, one has an honest mind. Avoiding sexual misconduct, one has a pure mind. One speaks the truth, one speaks what brings harmony to others. One speaks gently and politely to others. One speaks in meaningful and significant ways. Avoiding covetousness, one remains satisfied with what one has. Avoiding ill will, one develops loving kindness. And avoiding wrong views, one holds right views. Those are the ten courses of wholesome action. Now, karma is so important in Buddhism because our willed actions produce effects. Our willed actions, our karmas, have two kinds of effects. One is the immediately visible psychological effect. The other is a special kind of karmic effect. First of all, karma is important because our volitional actions, one by one, determine our characters our personalities, the total quality of our being. Every willed action that we perform has a certain tendency to repeat itself, to reproduce itself in the future. It's somewhat like a protozoan, like an amoeba. And when the action is performed, then it leaves a track on the mind, an imprint which can mark the beginning of a new mental tendency. As these actions multiply, then they form our character. Our character, our being, our personality, is nothing really but the sum of all of our willed actions, the kind of cross-section of all our accumulated karmas. So by yielding to first and simple ways to the unwholesome impulses of the mind, section of all our accumulated comments. So by yielding first and simple ways to the unwholesome impulses of the mind, then we build up little by little a greedy character, a hostile, aggressive character, a deluded character. On the other hand, by resisting these unwholesome desires, by replacing them by their opposites, by the wholesome qualities, then we can develop generous characters, loving and compassionate personality. We can become wise and enlightened beings. These changes don't come suddenly, they don't come overnight, but they build up little by little. And the way they come is by changing our karmas, our action patterns. By changing the action patterns, one by one, we transform our habits. First, low and difficult, but as we gain experience and familiarity, then it becomes natural to us. As we change our habits, we change our character. As we change our character, we change our total being, our whole world. 
That's why the Buddha emphasizes so strongly the importance of being mindful of every action, of every choice. Because every deed we perform, every choice we make, has tremendous potential for the future. The Buddha compares the process of our, of our development to the filling of a bucket. If we put a bucket under a leaking tap, then the bucket doesn't get filled with just one, two, or three drops of water from the tap. But if we leave the bucket under the tap for an hour or two hours, then it will become full to the top with water. In the same way, we transform ourselves for good or for bad by our individual willed actions, which each leave their imprint, their impression on the mind, which each form the track of a new mental tendency. So that's the psychological effect of karma. But then karma is also very important because karma has the ability to ripen in the future the ability to produce results in accordance with a universal moral law. Whenever we perform a deliberate action, an act with intention, that action deposits a seed in the mind, a seed with a potency to bring about effects in the future. These effects correspond to the nature of the, of the original action. They follow from the ethical tone of the action. So our unwholesome commas bounce back to us. They lead us to states of harm and suffering. In the same way, our wholesome commas also eventually return to us, leading to our happiness and to our well-being. Seen from this angle, the angle of the comic law, the universe appears to maintain a certain moral equili equilibrium, a balance between all the morally significant deeds and the situations of those who perform them. So the law of karma is a moral application of the old principle that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. However, the working of karma isn't mechanical. Karma is willed action, and the will is part of one of our faculties is something alive and organic. And therefore, karma allows much room for variation, for the play of living forces. First of all, not all karma has to ripen as a matter of strict necessity. Every karma, every volitional action has a tendency to act, to ripen, but it doesn't always ripen inevitably. Karma is like seeds. Seeds ripen if they meet the right conditions, but if they don't meet the right conditions, then they remain as seeds. And if they are destroyed, then they can never ripen at all in the future. Similarly, it can be said of karma that karma pushes for an opportunity to mature. It has a tendency to mature. If the karma meets the right conditions, if it finds the opportunity, then it will bring its result. But if it doesn't meet those conditions, then it won't ripen. And it can even be destroyed by other karma. And it's very important to understand that our present way of life, our attitudes, conduct, and so on, can influence the way our past karmas mature. Some past karmas that we've performed are so strong that they have to come to fruition. We can't escape them at all, no matter what we do. But the greatest number of our past karmas are conditioned by the way we live now. If we live unwisely, heedlessly, this will give the past bad karmas the opportunity to produce results and it will hinder the good commas from producing their effects, or else it will cancel out their good effects. On the other hand, if we live wisely and diligently now, then this will work in the opposite way. It will give the opportunity to our past good commas. It will enable them to mature, and it will bar out our bad commas. It will weaken them, destroy them, 
or prevent them from coming to fruition. Another fact to be understood about karma is that karma can produce its results at different times, even in different lives. It doesn't show its results immediately. The Buddha says that there are three kinds of karmas distinguished by way of time of ripening. First, there's karma that ripens in this present lifetime. Then there's karma that will ripen in the next lifetime. And third, there's karma that will ripen in some lifetime after the next. This last kind of karma, this is the strongest. If the other two kinds, the first two kinds, don't find an opening, then they become defunct. They'll never ripen if they don't ripen either in the present life or in the next life. But this third kind of karma remains with us as long as we continue in samsara, as long as we're subject to rebirth, it can find its opportunity. It can bring its results even hundreds and thousands of aeons in the future. Now this time lag sometimes helps us understand what might seem to be a discrepancy in the working of karma. Sometimes we see good people who meet with a lot of suffering and then bad people who meet with great success, with good fortune. That comes about because of the time lag and the maturing of karma. The good man is reaping the results of bad karma from the past, maybe from past lives. But in the future, he will eventually gain the pleasant results from the good karma he's performing now. And in the opposite way, the bad man is enjoying good fortune because of the he's reaping the results of his past good karma. But in the future, when his bad karma that he's performing now matures, then he will eventually meet with suffering. There's no escape from this balance that eventually tends to bring good results for good actions and bad results for bad actions. The working of karma is so complex and so subtle that it's almost impossible to make definite predictions. All that we can know with certainty are the tendencies, and that's enough to guide our actions. Now, karma produces its results in different ways. In two general ways it comes to fruition can be distinguished. One is to produce the type of rebirth, the basic rebirth consciousness. The other way is to produce the various results that we meet with in the course of life. At the time of death, one particular dominant karma comes to the forefront of the mind and it steers the stream of consciousness to the new existence. Then once this takes place, once rebirth takes place, then during the course of life, other karmas mature, bringing either favorable results, success, wealth, increase, talent, spiritual progress, and so on, or else bringing unfavorable results, poverty, misfortune, suffering, spiritual obstacles, so on. Now, this functioning of karma, the way good karma brings good results and bad karma brings bad results, this is an entirely natural process. It's part of the built-in structure of events, not something imposed on things by any outside power. Each action has the ability to produce the results appropriate to itself just through the nature of the action itself. This is called the Kamanayama, the order of Kama, which functions autonomously. And the good and bad results that come from the wholesome and unwholesome actions, these are not rewards and punishments. Actions produce their results naturally through the law of cause and effect working in the moral realm. There's no director, no supervisor standing over it. Now we might mention some specific cases that show the working of karma in our lives. In the human world, we see that some people have long lives, some short lives. Some are always healthy, some are often sick, some are beautiful, some are ugly, and so on. The question might arise, what are the causes for these differences? In a sutta, the Buddha explained in a detailed way 
how karma is the cause behind all these differences in the fortunes of beings. He says that the reason why some people die prematurely is because in the past they destroyed life. The comic result of killing is to be short-lived. Other people live long lives. The cause, the Buddha says, is that in previous lives they were kind and compassionate. They had respect and reverence for life. Some people are very sickly. The cause for that in the past, they injured and hurt other beings. Some people are always healthy. These are the people who helped others, who gave and assisted others. Then those who are often angry and harsh in the past, they become ugly. Those who are patient and cheerful, they become beautiful. Some are rich. These are the people who were generous in the past. Some are poor. These are the ones who are selfish. Some are influential. These are the ones who rejoiced in the good fortune of others, who sympathize with the success of others. Then some are weak and powerless. These are the people who are envious of the good fortune of others. Then some people are intelligent. These are the ones who were reflective and studious in the past, who always inquired and investigated matters. And then those who are dull-minded and stupid, these are the ones who are lazy and negligent in the past, who never studied, who never thought very much. From this, given by the Buddha in the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, we can see that the appropriate result always follows from the specific type of kama, that each kama produces a kind of result that corresponds exactly to itself. Now, we said before that karma, the main function, or one of the main functions of karma, is to produce the basic type of rebirth, to generate the rebirth consciousness. And the question comes up, which karma will take on this role? And here, karmas are ranked by way of their priority in taking on this very important role. The first priority goes to a very morally weighty, very heavy kind of action. As if a person has performed a very weighty, morally significant karma in the course of his life, that karma will take on the role of generating rebirth. And there are certain types of karmas like this on the unwholesome side and on the wholesome side. On the unwholesome side, the heavy karmas are such acts as taking the life of one's mother, taking the life of one's father, taking the life of an arahant, wounding a Buddha, and causing a schism in the Sangha in the order of monks. If a person has performed one of these actions, then that karma will come up at the time of death and determine rebirth. And where it will reproduce rebirth will be in one of these states of misery, a very painful type of rebirth involving much suffering. On the other hand, the weighty, wholesome commas, these are the attainments of the higher meditative states, the jhanas, the stages of samadhi. These produce always a good rebirth, a rebirth in one of the higher worlds. Then, if there is no especially heavy karma, either good or bad, then the next karma to take precedence in determining rebirth will be some strong ethical karma performed close to the time of death. Thus, if somebody generates a strong, wholesome karma just before death, then even though he's lived a bad life, if he really undergoes a genuine change of heart and starts generating strong, wholesome karma, that will become a wholesome death proximate karma which can produce a good rebirth in the next life. For example, a murderer who's about to be executed might suddenly become filled with remorse for his crime. He might become filled with compassion for people. And then he might really wish that he could turn over a new leaf. That might lead, that stay, that change of heart could lead to a favorable rebirth in the next life. It doesn't mean that he'll escape from the effects of his bad karma. 
His evil actions have been stored up in the mind. They're present. And eventually they can catch up with him at some time. But the form of rebirth in the immediately following life will be decided by that wholesome karma that's come up just before death. On the other hand, somebody might have lived a very good life, but just before death he might become very angry, very frightened, very greedily attached to his possessions, clinging tenaciously. And then that unwholesome death proximate karma that can generate a lower type of rebirth, an unfortunate rebirth. Again, this doesn't mean that he'll miss out on the fruits of his good deeds. Those good deeds can still produce their effects, either in the next life or in some future existence. But for the next life, the bad karma will take on the determinative role. Then, if there's no very significant death proximate karma, good or bad, the next karma that will come up to generate rebirth will be habitual karma, some action that we've performed habitually in the course of our lifetime. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, it's habitual karma that causes rebirth. But if there's no special significant habitual karma, then some other miscellaneous karma can, that has been performed and stored up, this can come up to the mind at the time of death and bring about rebirth. This introduces the element of uncertain, uncertainty or unpredictability about the rebirth process. That there are sometimes these very unexpected occasions when some stored up karma from the distant past suddenly comes up and takes on the rebirth determining role. The next topic to be discussed is the plane of existence where karma produces rebirth. And this requires a little overview, a short survey of the Buddhist cosmology, the Buddhist picture of the universe. Buddhism divides the whole of sentient existence into three basic realms. One is called the sense sphere realm, another the realm of fine materiality, the third the immaterial or formless realm. The sense sphere realm has six divisions. There are the hells, which are states of intense torment and suffering. Then there's the sphere of the papers. The papers are afflicted spirits, sometimes called hungry ghosts, beings with strong, tormenting desires, hunger and thirst that they can never satisfy. They're usually depicted in Buddhist art as beings with very big bellies, tremendous bellies, and very small mouths the mouth the size of a pinhole. And they are always tormented by strong hunger and thirst. And they go looking for food and drink, but they can never get enough of it. The next is the animal kingdom, the realm of animals, where the dominant characteristic of beings is dullness of mind and strong brute-like desires. The next sphere is called the sphere of the Azuras, the Azura world. The Azuras are titanic beings dominated by strong passions, by the desire for power, ambition, competitiveness. They are frequently fighting with the deities, with the gods in the heavens, jealous of the fortune of the gods. Now these four realms, the hells, the animal realms, the world of Pretas and the world of the Azuras, are together called the plain of misery, and all of these states of rebirth are considered unfortunate, undesirable states of rebirth. Then, in the sense sphere realm, there are two good planes of rebirth. One is the human world, the other is the heavenly world, the world of the Vedas. The sense sphere contains six heavenly planes, and the beings who live there enjoy long life, beauty, happiness, power, and so on. But life in all the heavenly planes is impermanent, subject to pass away. And therefore the heavens aren't the goal, the object of aspiration for those following the Buddhist path to liberation. Rebirth takes place into those realms as a result of good karma. But those seeking to go beyond the round of rebirth to attain Nibbana don't make the heavenly realms their ultimate aim. 
In fact, the Buddha points out that of all the planes of existence, the most fortunate from the standpoint of seeking liberation is the human world. The reason is because the human world exhibits a balance of all the different forces. It exhibits the qualities of being a middle way. On the one hand, life there is not so unbearably filled with suffering that thought and reflection are not possible. It allows enough pleasure, enough ease and comfort that we can reflect on the nature of existence and that we can develop our understanding. On the other hand, life in the human world is not so intensely pleasant and enjoyable and long in duration like the heavenly world. So that we become deceived by the pleasure into taking enjoyment as always the final end of life. So we become deceived by the long lifespan into think thinking that our lives are eternal. But it has just the balance of pleasure and of pain. It has enough pain also that we become awakened to the unsatisfactory nature of existence. It's short enough so that we become aware of the truth of impermanence. Now rebirth into the planes of misery, into the four unhappy states of existence, comes about to ten unwholesome courses of action. These are given as taking life, stealing, engaging in sexual misconduct, that is, adultery and seduction, speaking falsehood, speaking slander, speaking harshly, speaking gossip and idle chatter, then having a mind of covetousness, a mind of ill will, and holding wrong views. These unwholesome commas, if they take on the rebirth-producing role, bring about rebirth in the plane of misery. Then the cause for rebirth in the fortunate plane of the sense sphere, in the human world and in the sense sphere heavenly world, that is the ten courses of wholesome action, that is abstaining from the ten unwholesome ones. Also the performance of works of merit, that is practicing generosity, giving gifts and help to others, observing moral discipline, and developing the simple forms of meditation, developing the meditations on loving kindness, developing some purity of mind. When these become, take on the rebirth generating role, then they produce rebirth into the human world and into the sense sphere heavenly world. Then beyond the sense sphere heaven, there is the realm of fine material forms, the realm of subtle matter. And rebirth into this realm comes about through the certain high meditative attainments called the jhanas, states of deep concentration, deep absorption, when the mind becomes pure, serene, very focused, and all the thought processes quiet down. And the jhanas have different levels of depth, and when they're attained and mastered and kept at the time of death, then they produce rebirth in one of the heavens of the fine material realm, according to their level of depth. These states of existence in the fine material realm, these are much purer even than the sense sphere realm. Here the mind becomes very pure, very luminous. The lifespan is incredibly long, lasting for aeons and aeons. And the coarse types of matter don't exist in these realms. There remains only subtle, very fine material form. Eventually, though, life in these realms also comes to an end, and the person who has been reborn there will pass away and takes on rebirth elsewhere, as determined by his karma. Then beyond the four jhanas, there are four higher levels of samadhi called the four formless attainments, states of deep, extremely deep concentration. That is, the sphere of infinite space, sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of nothingness, and the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. And those who attain these states of concentration, master them and possess them at the time of, de of death, these persons will take rebirth in the immaterial realm, in the formless realm. Here all material form, all matter comes to an end. 
These states of existence are entirely mental. The mind exists there without any material base, absorbed in pure peace, pure equanimity, for thousands of aeons. But in this case, too, the karma that brought rebirth here eventually becomes exhausted, the lifetime comes to an end, and the beings take rebirth elsewhere, as determined by their karma. Now, a question might be summed up, might be raised, whether a Western person with a scientific education can really believe this cosmology seems to be ancient, outdated, and superstitious. And here I'll have to give my personal answer. It seems to me that while some of the details of the cosmology might be subject to question, I feel that there are good reasons for regarding the general form of this cosmology as quite tenable. If we can see the logic behind the law of karma, then if we consider the different kinds of actions people are capable of performing, it seems that there has to be an appropriate plane of existence for the maturation of the different types of karma. If there are certain very bad karmas, like killing thousands of people cruelly and heartlessly, in order for that karma to meet its due compensation, we need an appropriate plane of existence where it can bring its fruit. Thus, for such kinds of karma, we need a realm of intense suffering, the hell realm. Then, on the other hand, if somebody has performed very noble deeds, he gives up all his wealth, his limbs, his life for the sake of others. If this person has very pure conduct, a very loving and compassionate mind, that state of being also needs a corresponding realm to produce its due results. That is the heavenly realm. Also, once we understand the different meditative attainments, the jhanas and the formless attainments, and see how those are higher levels of consciousness, very different from the familiar ones, becomes clear that they correspond to other planes of existence of an equivalent nature to themselves. And thus the whole picture fits together very logically. But the specially determining reason is found in our own mind. If we look into our own mind, we can see that all of these different planes are already contained there in seed form. The dominant forces in our minds will be human states, states tied to the human world, since that is the basic tone of our consciousness. But at times there will arise states of intense hatred, which might express itself as violence and cruelty. Those states, at that moment, we are constructing for ourselves a hell world. We are, psychologically, we might be living in the hell. And karmically, those states are the seeds of rebirth into the hell. At other times, very noble thoughts will arise. Thoughts that make us feel divine or heavenly. Thoughts of supreme generosity, of great kindness and compassion. These thoughts when they arise, our world becomes very light and pure, almost like a heavenly world. And these states, in fact, are the seeds of rebirth to the heavenly world. They are the channel that leads upwards, the ladder that leads to the heavenly state. In our states of blind desire, our brutishness, our blind lust, our dull stupidity, we can see the mind of the animal. We can understand those states to be the seeds of the animal world. And when we indulge in them, we're constructing a rebirth into the animal world. We can see sometimes selfishness, possessiveness, intense clinging. At that time, our mind becomes similar to that of a preta, an afflicted spirit. And we're constructing or planting the seeds of rebirth into the world of the preta. Again, there will come up states of greed for power, jealousy and envy, competitiveness, the urge for power. At that time, we have the mind of an Azura, and we're laying the foundations for rebirth into the world of the Azura. All these realms of existence are already present in us as seeds in our own mind. So what really lies behind this whole picture, behind all the planes of rebirth, is the mind. 
the Buddha says that mind is the architect of the whole universe. We shouldn't think of the rebirth process in terms of the image of a human being just appearing in different realms, moving from realm to realm. What lies behind the whole cosmos with all of its different realms of existence is the mind. The different tendencies in the mind, its different volitions, desires, actions, simply spell themselves out as the different planes of existence. And all these planes are simply the visible manifestations, the outer projections of the forces at work in the mind, of the different volitions that arise and become accumulated inwardly in the mental continuum. Thus the outer world with its different planes of existence is the visible register of the volitional tendencies built up and stored in the mind. And these planes simply provide the field for the mind to work out its accumulated tendencies. The Buddha says that the mind is the maker of all the world, the leader, the thing that dominates and governs all other things. And all the outward diversifications found in the world, these correspond to the diversifications of the mind, of volition. All of that is the concrete expression of the volitions in the mind coming out into the open. Now, the twin teachings on karma and rebirth have several important implications for getting a correct perspective on our lives. First of all, they imply that the objective situation in which we find ourselves now is exactly the situation appropriate for ourselves. We can't blame our troubles on our environment, on our heredity, on faith, on our upbringing, and so on. All these factors have made us what we are, but the reason we've met with these circumstances is because of our past karma. According to the Buddha's teaching, we're fully responsible for what we are. We've planted the seeds in the past, and now we're reaping the results. Even our personalities are the products of our mental formations established over many lives. We inherit the results of our own actions. This might seem to be at first a pessimistic doctrine. It seems to imply that we're the prisoner of our past karma, that we're bound in by our old actions and just have to submit to their effects. But this view would be a distortion. It's true that very often we have to resist we have to reap the results of our past karma. But the important point to understand is that karma is volitional action, and volitional action takes place in the present, always and only in the present. This means that in the present we have the ability to change the entire direction of our lives. Our world space, is not only a matter of objective circumstances, our environment and so on, but also of our subjective frame of mind. If we examine our lives close up, we'll see that our experience falls into two groups, into experiences that come to us passively, which we receive independently of our choice, and experiences which we create ourselves through our choices and attitudes. The first, the objective circumstances, the passive side of experience, that is largely the effect of past karma, and that we generally have to face no matter what we think of it. But within those limitations, there is a space, the tremendous space of the present moment in which we can construct a world with our own minds now. If we let ourselves be dominated by selfishness, hatred, ambition, dullness, then even if we're wealthy and powerful and famous, we'll still be living in misery and suffering and planting the seeds for a rebirth in the world of suffering in the future. On the other hand, even though we might be poor and in bad circumstances with much pain and misfortune, if we observe pure conduct, develop a mind of generosity and kindness and understanding, then we can transform our world. We can build a world of light, of love, of peace, even a heaven on earth, 
that all depends on the mind. Now we come to a special topic in the Buddhist teaching on karma, and this is the relation of karma to the path of liberation. The ultimate aim in following the path of the Buddha is not simply to achieve good results by performing good karma. That is a mundane aim, not the final aim. The highest aim, the true aim, is to get beyond the chain of karma and results. As long as we go on performing karma, accumulating karma, we remain subject to birth and death, to wandering in samsara with its different realms. And then we have to meet suffering in its different forms. Whether we're living in a fortunate world or in an unfortunate world, that is secondary. All states of existence are impermanent, without substance. All are dukkha, incapable of giving final satisfaction. Good karma binds us to good results, bad karma to bad results. But whether the results are good or bad, we're still in bondage. Our chains are still chains whether they're made of gold or iron. The aim of following the Dharma is to reach the freedom that lies beyond karma, beyond the cycle of karma and results. That aim, that goal, is to be reached by a special type of karma, which the Buddha calls the karma that leads to the end of karma. This karma is the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. Ordinary karma is action conditioned by clinging. If we're clinging to good, we perform good action which leads to good results. If we're clinging to bad, we, lead, we perform bad actions which lead to bad results. The force behind both is clinging, and clinging rests upon ignorance. But there's another kind of karma, a karma which leads beyond clinging. This is the karma of practicing the path, the karma of developing mindfulness and insight. By developing mindfulness insight, we see things as they are, as impermanent, empty phenomena, subject to conditions, rolling on through conditions. As this insight deepens, we put an end to clinging, and by eliminating clinging, we break free from the chains of karma and discover the freedom beyond karma, the freedom of liberation. The Arahant, the liberated one, doesn't generate any more karmas. He continues to act, he performs volitional action, but his actions no longer constitute karma. They don't leave any imprint upon the mind. They don't lead to the depositing of any seed in the mental continuum with the potency to ripen in the future, to bring about rebirths or results in the future. The activities of the Arahant are called Kriyas, not Kama. Kriya means simple action. He acts, he performs deeds according to his will, but his deeds leave no trace on the mental continuum. They're just like the flight of birds across the sky. The Arahant has broken the chains of karma, chains of action and result, and he's reached final deliverance, the freedom from all action and bondage.